morning everyone welcome once again to Elim Harrogate a warm welcome to everyone whether you are regulars whether you are visiting whether it's your first time here you are all very very welcome we are a little thin on the ground um, both here and up on stage but uh, hopefully that won't deter from us blessing God this morning we are here too bless the Lord. I just want to open with Psalm 8. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honour. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seeds. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. We thank God that he is our God, that he gave all things to us. He gave this earth to us to, to care for, for him. He loves every single one of us. He is so amazing, so huge that he could create the heavens, and yet he cares about the minutest detail in our lives. We say, O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. We thank you, Lord, for who you are, and Lord, we come to praise you this morning. Amen. Let's praise the Lord.
perhaps you want to offer up your own thanks and praise to God this morning. I know we do have so much to thank him for. We have new life to thank him for. Lord, I will offer up my thanks and praise for this new life that has come to join our church family recently. This little blessing, Michaela. A blessing to Lauren and Andy and big sister Elsie and a blessing to this church family. We thank you for all she is, already all she is and all she is going to be, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let your 
because the work was finished you were buried in the ground but the grave could not contain you
it's on. Oh. I feel like I'm hogging the limelight a little bit here, actually. Heather? <laughs> Sorry, can we just hang on just for a moment? Um, what we were going to do at the end, can we do now? Yeah. Is that okay? Um, as you will have noticed, Pastor Andy is in the church this morning along with his gorgeous wife Lauren and his beautiful daughters Elsie and Michaela. And it is Michaela's first Sunday service. Yeah. So we want to offer a huge welcome to Michaela. I know we sort of touched on it a little earlier, but I want to make something of this because it's kind of significant. And obviously, I didn't mean to leave proud grandparents out of the prayer earlier as well, but, you know, obviously they are here as well, Heather and Steve, and it's lovely to have you all here. We have something for you. Would you just like to perhaps just come up? Maybe, Heather, we can, we can pray for them as well. What do you think? Is that okay? Lord, we just thank you. We thank you for this beautiful blessing and beautiful addition to our church family here in Elim, Harrogate. And Lord, we thank you that this long-awaited birth is just, oh, she's so beautiful. She's so beautiful. Lord, thank you for the blessings that she is already bringing. And Lord, we do pray your abundant blessings on Andy, Lauren, Elsie, and Michaela and their extended family, and for who they are to this church, Lord. Bless their home. Bless their lives. In your precious name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Just a little something from all of us here and to add to the blessing, but yes. Yeah, so that's why it's not signed. <laughs> it's not, not signed, not, um, not sealed. But yeah. Welcome. Do you want to say something? Oh, just to say thank you. Um, thank you, Lord, because it was a, there was a couple of times Lauren got kind of unwell, but the church rallied around us and the Lord helped us. And then she came safely in the end. So we're just, we're just thrilled. You know, um, most of you will know, but there was a few years there where we were told we couldn't have kids, and Elsie was a wee blessing, a wee miracle, and then this one was just a complete surprise as well. So we just, we just, we just praise God. You know, He's a, He's a good God, and He He just blesses you, and He gives you things, and He heals things, and He He blesses you in ways that you don't always expect or or understand. So we're just we're excited and we just pray i pray for her baby's first church service but i just pray this is the life she chooses for herself one day when she's old enough to make those decisions and i'll ask many of you to pray those kind of prayers with me as the years go on for both yeah. of them yeah um but i'm sure we've got your support because we've had it so much already thank you <laughs> Thank you. They can pray for Grandad's wallet because I think that's it. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> oh. Oh. So I think Heather, you were headed upstairs, weren't you? So any. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Okay. Um, church, would you, if you have your Bibles with you, um, would you turn to the book of Acts, please? If you don't have a Bible with you, we have some Bibles at the back. And as Andy has said every week, if you don't own a Bible, please feel free to take one as a gift from uh, this church. So book of Acts, chapter 7. At the end of chapter 7, we're starting. We're going to be looking at quite a, a big proportion of this. Um, at first of all, I will just pray. Lord, my prayer this morning is that you may speak 
to others through these words. Lord, that nothing of me but everything of you would take root in the heart, hearts of those listening to, pro to proclaim your truth and your glory. Amen. So we're going to look, first of all, at... Um, we're going to look at the story of Saul today. And I wanted to draw some parallels um, that can be used by us today. And hopefully this story will be of great encouragement to us all. So if we start in Acts chapter 7, verse 58. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling on to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Chapter 8. And Saul approved of his execution. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the gospel, gospel, apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. The end of Acts and the beginning of uh, the end of Acts uh, chapter seven and the beginning of chapter eight describes the stoning of Stephen, which Saul witnessed and approved of. This young man Saul was to become one of the most important people in the history of Christianity, the Apostle Paul. Paul is attributed with writing thirteen out of the twenty-seven books of the New Testament, but at this point we learn that he is quite a brutal young man with a serious aversion to the first followers of Christ. Saul, stroke Paul, was both a Jew and a Roman citizen and well-educated by rabbinic scholars. He was a member of the Pharisees who believed in non-biblical traditions as much as, the Hebrew Bible, as much as the Hebrew Bible. His motivation for the persecution of the Christian movement, however, seems to not be linked to his Pharisaism. Nonetheless, Saul was intent on persecuting the first Christians. After the stoning of Stephen, Saul helped to lead the persecution against the early church. But then something quite dramatic happened to him en route to Damascus. We're going to turn to, chap uh, to Acts chapter 9 and verse 1, which documents this. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand, and brought him into Damascus, and for three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul, for behold, he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem, and here he has authority from the chief priests 
to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house. And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you came, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized, and taking food he was strengthened. For some days he was with the disciples at Damascus, and immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and said, Is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon this name? And has he not come here for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. Amen. So, quite a long passage of scripture there, but I felt it was important to encompass all of that story. So, what can we draw from this story today? Um, I've come up with three points. First of all, is there someone you have in mind that you think is a complete write-off or has very little chance of, there's very little chance of them ever accepting the gospel? Do you know someone who seems so averse to hearing the truth of the gospel you just can't see any way that they will ever accept it? My guess would be yes, I do. And as much as we can pray and pray for the salvation of those we know, I'm sure we have some in mind that we just think they're never going to hear the truth. Can God really do anything with them? Can God really reach them? The encouragement here is that Saul was so opposed to the early Christians. He was Hebrew, he would have known God and his character, but he was also a Roman citizen, so he would have had great exposure to the Roman influences as well. It sounds to me that he might have been quite an ambitious young man, and that's my own reading into the scriptures. But if I was going to paint a picture in my mind of that Saul, I would probably portray him as arrogant, brutish, harsh, and unwilling to move from his standpoint. He would certainly have not been any pushover. It does sound like the stoning of Stephen was pretty much mob behaviour, and it says Saul approved of that execution. We also later learn that the disciple Ananias had also heard of Saul by reputation, and he said, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. Ananias has heard of Saul's bad, bad reputation. So he's got a name for himself. And Ananias is pretty shocked he's going to be, he's being asked to put himself in the path of so much danger. So this picture of Saul is not painted as a gentle, reasonable man. But God reached him. God brought him to his knees. God completely and radically transformed his life until he became one of the most committed followers of Jesus Christ there has ever been. He went on to preach the gospel to so many in person and then through his written word over the last 2,000 years we have read his epistles is preaching the good news of the transformative, saving nature of Christ. His legacy is one of the most important. Saul's, Paul's story and the teachings of Christ have gone on to help transform the lives of millions. If God could do that with Saul and turn his life completely around, God can do it again and again, and we know from many testimonies, testimonies here in this church, 
of how God has turned lives around. For those who have seemed the most unlikely of su subjects, God has turned their lives around. You guys here know from Teen Challenge, Nicky Cruz, who was entrenched in gang warfare, who would have thought he would have his life turned around? Many of you here, who would have thought your lives would have been turned around? Who would have thought that you would have heard the truth of the gospel? But you did. And God's miraculous intervention in your lives, when it seemed unlikely and impossible, he reached you. He does and is and will transform and change lives. So I urge you to keep praying for those on your hearts. Don't give up hope because you know that there is hope. Second point is God set a whole chain of events in place for Saul's transformation. So we read about Saul's encounter with God on the road to Damascus, but simultaneously to that, God has been speaking to Ananias in a vision to prepare Saul's reception there. Those plans needed to be in place, ready for this to work. I have my own story about God putting plans and people in place. Very key to my own Christian journey. It's easy for me now to look back and see just how much of that was God. It wasn't coincidence, it was God putting things where they needed to be, people where they needed to be. About, goodness, where are we now? 22, 23 years ago, before I moved back to Harrogate after the breakdown of my marriage, I was still studying with Jehovah's Witnesses. God knew that I was seeking, but he needed me in the right place. So I moved back to Harrogate from near Weatherby, um, and I moved to about a stone's throw away from where the Kingdom Hall originally was. Shortly after that, my study plan with them um, was completed, and they no longer had any need to call on me. Um, if I hadn't made my decision to become a baptized Jehovah's Witness, they had to leave me alone then. It was down to me. And as far as they were concerned, I was right off. So I was in limbo. I was in wilderness. Now, shortly after moving to Harrogate, um, my elder daughter, who was about 11 years old at that time, befriended another girl uh, who used to come and visit her father um, at, for the weekend. So she'd come across on a Friday evening, stay with him for two nights and go back to stay with her mum for the rest of the week. He lived across the road from us. Um, Danny, my daughter, started going to the same youth group with this girl um, on a Friday evening. Just so happened to be Elam Youth Group here in this church. Oops, sorry. And then she started going with this friend to church on a Sunday and would come back singing over the mountains and the sea and my Jesus, my Saviour. In the meantime, I needed a full-time job. <coughs> Excuse me. We were really, really struggling on the intermittent wage that I was bringing in as a single parent. Now, another neighbour across the road had just moved in. Um, she ran an employment agency. And we became friends. And she decided I needed a full-time, regular job, regular income. And so she arranged for an interview for me at a company on Hornbin Park. Regardless of whether I wanted the job or not, she arranged the interview for me. She said, at the very least, the interview experience would be good for me. So I went to the interview and I got the job and started working for the company that I would actually be with the next 11 years. One of the women who interviewed me was my new manager and she asked if I would like to be one of her tenants. She had a couple of houses on Harlow Hill, 
and knew that they would be better suited to me and the children than where we were living. I accepted. Turns out this house was on the very next street to where Danny's new friend, Friday friend, actually lived during the week with her mum. So Danny had this friend there, right next, next street. So with Danny being taken to church on a Sunday by these people up on Harlow Hill, then I started being brought to church on a Sunday by these folks up on Harlow Hill. Hence, I started attending Elim and came back to Christ shortly afterwards. All of these things being put in place and I look back and see how God was working in my life, even before I really knew who he was. The move back to Harrogate, the Friday friend, the job, the move up the hill. So I know firsthand that when God wants to put a plan in place, he can and he does. I would challenge you to look back on your own lives and your own Christian journey and think, are there any situations that seemed like such a coincidence that only God could have put that person there or placed you where you were for an unexpected outcome? I suspect that you might be pleasantly surprised to realize just how many times God has intervened in your life. My third point. Ananias trusted God despite what he thought he knew. I love it when you see something new in the scripture. Something jumps out at you. If ever there was an example of Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. This is it. Ananias, his understanding. He had heard all about the reputation of this brute Saul who was happy, happily persecuting believers. Why on earth would he put himself in harm's way by going to meet this man face to face? Why? Because God told him to. And he was to meet him on the path called straight. Perhaps Proverbs 3, 5 and 6 was prophetic or perhaps by telling Ananias to go to the path called straight, God was reminding him of those words that he could trust in God, even when his understanding was that this was a very dangerous situation to be put in. We know that there are often references to Old Testament scriptures and texts in the New Testament that are used as reminders of God's promises, and perhaps this is one of them. It seems to me like too much of a coincidence. Ananias, go to the path called straight, straight. Where is that? Where have I heard that before? Oh yes, Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding. God's plan wouldn't have worked without Ananias' obedience. So, have you ever felt that there was anything God was asking you to do, but it just seemed too outrageous to be true? I wonder. I'm not saying that you need to go and deliberately put yourself in the face of mortal danger. And obviously with everything, there should be testing against the scriptures and confirmation that it's the right thing to do. But I wouldn't necessarily write it off. I would suggest that wisdom would be to pray, to seek counsel from other trusted Christians, test it against what you know to be scriptural and true. But it isn't against the realms of possibility that God could be asking you to step right outside of your comfort zone and place all your trust in him. It doesn't necessarily have to be a dangerous situation more likely an uncomfortable or unfamiliar one. But God has ways of asking us to fully rely on him. Asking us to step into situations where is, there is no way that we can do it in our own strength or in our own knowledge. It has to be his works for his glory. Where there is God, there is a way. 
So, what have we learned? Number one, don't write anyone off. Keep praying for God's intervention in the lives of those you know and love. Number two, God can and does intervene and he does put things in place for our salvation and furthering his kingdom here on earth. Number three, keep trusting in God at all times and don't assume you always know what is going on. It's God's plan and we should trust in it. Amen. So now we'll come to communion. God's kingdom plan also involved something that many non-Christians find so hard to comprehend, but that we now fully understand the significance and enormity and importance of the death of his only son, Jesus Christ. Jesus willingly went to the cross to pay the price of humankind's sin. Because Adam was created perfect, but by his disobedience became imperfect. Only the price of a perfect life for a perfect life could atone for that sin. Jesus Christ was God's perfect gift to the world. Born human, the promised Messiah came to point to a better way. He gave up his perfect life on the cross. But by his resurrection and the return of the promised Holy Spirit, we now have unlimited access to our Lord God. Before his betrayal and crucifixion, Jesus asked his followers to remember his broken body and his shed blood by means of a communal breaking of bread and drinking of the cup. And we do this now as a body of believers, gathered together to remember his sacrifice. I would invite you to come and take uh, communion in your own time. But let me read Paul's words to the church in Corinth. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us now share in the body and the blood of Christ, giving thanks to him who made a way. Amen.
the daylight, Lord, let your love surround me in the daylight, Lord. You alone are holy, you alone are holy, you alone are holy, keeper of my soul. You alone are holy, you alone are holy, you alone are holy, keeper of my soul. Your song is with me, Lord. A warm embrace, let your song surround me. At night, your song is with me, Lord. A warm embrace, let your song surround me. In the night time, Lord.
Lord, bless our week as we go into our daily lives together, Lord. Let your word, your truth, your gospel be shared to all we come across. In your precious name, Jesus, amen. Please hang around for some refreshments and some fellowship. I'm not sure if there are any notices I need to share. Oh, there are some um, New Direction magazines at the back if anybody hasn't collected yours and there's a little jar. Also, Ron would never forgive me if I didn't remind you that if you have come prepared to give, we do have our uh, box at the back there.